Right. Hi, everyone. I'm super glad to be here. My name is Mark Serafim, and I'm a machine learning engineer at GraphCore. Where at GraphCore, we've built the IPU, which stands for the Intelligent Processing Unit. And the IPU is sort of the special purpose uh, hardware that we've built for the ground up with machine learning in mind. And uh, we believe we found, also found a natural home for it in drug discovery. So, you know, like I was saying earlier, like the IPU is sort of this fundamentally different processor designed for ML from the ground up. And the, the, the main thing I want you to take away from this talk is that it actually runs really fast and outperforms GPUs on a lot of current, current you know, uh, state of the art models, but also helps you think about like, what would the next, gener like, what, what would the next generation models gonna would look like? And so specifically, like there's uh, in, in natural language processing, so specifically transformer models, which have now also found in a very natural home in any sort of sequences, including genes or DNA, we get 2x speed ups. In computer vision, specifically for sparse uh, vision models, we see six times the throughput with lower, with lower latency. And for probabilistic machine learning, like uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, which typically have not found a natural way to be sped up on a GPU, we get 26 times speed up. So just really substantial speed ups there. And so instead of thinking about how to make um, like faster GPUs, just like, I don't know, like a, like a faster, faster horse, we wanted to think about like, well, what, what would next generation hardware look like if it was designed for machine learning from the ground up? So a bit more about us, like and at GraphCore, there's sort of three things that we provide. So the first thing is actually like the, the chip, like the IPU chip, which, which will be running all the algorithms. Uh, but the second is actually our software stack. So in, in our software stack, we have something called Poplar. You can sort of think of its equivalent to CUDA. And Poplar will let you program uh, the IPU in a very fine-grained way, just like make sure you can move all the data around to different tiles. And I'll go into more detail into that in a second. Uh, but even if you don't care about any of this stuff, if you're not a hardware person, we have like TensorFlow and PyTorch bindings, which completely abstract this stuff away from you. So you should be able to just take the same models that you have running on a CPU and GPU and get them running uh, on an IPU with like close to no code changes, if, if, if any. And so, and the last thing we provide is just like a way for you to provision, provision these chips. Um, so there's two ways we can do it. So if you're working with like really private data and you'd rather have it beyond prem, like we work with our partner Seriscale. Otherwise you can like partner, uh, partner up with Azure if you just want something like via the cloud. So we have a bunch of funding. So we definitely have like, you know, uh, like, so, so this helps, this helps us uh, stay honest. And a lot of these guys are, are people that we end up like partnering with. Um, and at this point, we're, we're a global company. So I personally, you know, have the luxury of working uh, remotely from San Diego, but I, I, I work at, for the Palo Alto office, but I have peers and customers all over the world. So like I said earlier, so, you know, if, if you were thinking about like, what would, what is machine learning going to look like in, you know, another 10 years, another 20 years, there's a few trends that have become like very obvious to us and, and one of the, made, made us design the hardware the way we did. So the first is like a massive parallelism. The second is a sparsity in data structures. The third is low precision compute. And we've seen this validated by uh, a lot of separate work by companies like Google noticing that you don't, you don't need like very high precision compute for machine learning. Uh, reusing model parameters and having a, a, a static graph structure. So the idea is like once you've experimented with your model enough, like at inference, odds are your graph is not going to change a lot. And so how can you make the static graph run really, really quickly? That said, we also have support for dynamic graphs with a compiler trick. And, you know, I'm happy to talk about that more in a bit, a bit more detail later. So funnily enough, so, so this is a slide sort of describing uh, the the, the progression of sizes of machine learning models. And funnily enough, the slide is already out of date. Like we, we see here that like, you know, at the upper end, we have like 6 billion models, which sounds huge, but like, you know, just only like a couple of weeks ago, we had GPT-3 that, uh, you know, is about like 170 billion models, uh, like so 170 billion parameters, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And so we expect this trend to continue and to continue growing exponentially. Um, but on, on one hand, this trend is, is fruitful because the models are actually better, like they're getting better performance on end-level results. But on the other hand, they're actually really expensive to run, both in terms of like, you know, how much you have to spend on those servers, and then two, and how, how long you actually have to wait. Like GPT-3, I believe, cost on the orders of hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions to, to train, 
and then it took several months to train. And so this idea of like dense computations at massive scale, while it may be affordable to a couple of companies over the world, is not a sustainable trend for everyone else. So we sort of need a new approach. So a sort of background here as to what this new approach would look like, uh, let's talk about GPUs for a sec. So GPUs use this model of uh, SIMD, which stands for a single instruction multiple data thread. And the idea is that all of the independent compute units perform the exact same instruction uh, on, uh, on, on, on different data. And so this was highly motivated by graphics. And, and while you can do matrix multiplication very efficiently in the same paradigm, which is why you can run deep learning algorithms very quickly on, on GPUs, it's, it's not actually sustainable for a whole bunch of other algorithms that don't necessarily fit in, 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 in this paradigm. So SIMD is, is, is one thing, but the IPU is, is a sort of like more uh, powerful architecture is called MIMD. So it's multiple instruction, multiple data, which means that you can have different compute tiles and run different instructions on different data on all of them in parallel completely separately. And so the way we do this efficiently is that you can see here, like in the blue and red, we intersperse both memory and compute on the same tile so that it's very uh, fast to access it. Uh, and this also lets us reduce the, the, the overall power usage for, for this to work. So we're pretty fortunate to also have like, uh, like many partners that collaborate on us with, with this. And I will say like for all of the benchmarks that I'm gonna present later, uh, they, were all, they, they all had a partner that, that we worked with. So we're, we're super fortunate there. Um, and you don't need to actually think about, uh, like, you know, while, while you can, like, while you can program the details of how to move data from uh, each style and how to synchronize it, like, as a programmer, you don't really need to worry about this. Like, our Poplar compiler worries about this. Like, we just want you to worry about your algorithms. And so, sort of, like, at a high level, the, the two very obvious benefits of this approach are being able to work with models with very high sparsity. So this is true for probabilistic models, it's true for graphs, it's true for like a sequence models, uh, like an NLP or genomics. Uh, it also lets us basically uh, get rid of these, you know, sort of misconceptions that we have about machine learning because of GPUs. Like for example, a lot of people think it's better, if you can generalize better uh, with, with larger batch sizes uh, because it's actually faster to run larger batch sizes on a GPU. Whereas in an IPU, this, this constraint doesn't exist and it's actually very fast to run very small batches. And so we've shown that if you run many smaller batches, you can actually increase the generalization uh, performance there. And it also lets you do faster real-time inference because you're not like sitting and waiting on data. So if you want to learn more about like how the IPU really works, like all the details of it, like we have this, uh, like, like Citadel did this nice survey where they really dissected all of the, like our, our architecture and micro benchmarked it. So you can just go to this archive link and, and check it out in uh, a lot more detail than I can go over in this talk. So the, the way all the tiles will end up synchronizing information is that, like I said, like it's MIMD, so each tile is gonna be doing its own thing. So they're gonna be computing something and then they're, they're gonna need to exchange like data that, that, that's, that's interdependent. And they do this via a sync stage, they then re-exchange and then they just repeat the stuff. So this par paradigm is called bulk synchronous parallel and it initially started off in distributed computing, but it ended up being like a very like natural fit on an IPU as well. Um, so I also want to mention that like I've personally mostly worked with uh, our Mark 1 IPU. So that's like our first generation one, but we, we recently announced our Mark 2, which uh, triples the in-processor memory. So this lets you run models uh, faster and larger models. And we do believe like larger models are going to continue uh, to, to dominate ML research. Um, and the way we think of all of this is that like our main competitor really is NVIDIA. NVIDIA is an amazing company. They build great products. And so we really have to build better products to, to, to compete with them. And we believe we, we've done this with the Mark II. So specifically with the Mark II, we, we, we believe we have orders of magnitude improvements in the floating point compute and uh, in the total amount of memory available. And the way we, and, and, and I just like at an incremental price difference. So uh, like, like between, like between ourselves and the A100 GPUs. However, like just, you know, looking at the actual cost of the machine is like a de deceiving metric because if the algorithms run more quickly, then you're going to spend a lot less on training time. So specifically, this was a collaboration that we had uh, with Microsoft on EfficientNet, which you can think of as a sparse image classification algorithm 
uh, we were able to replicate uh, replicate state of the art results with about two hundred fifty thousand dollars versus three million dollars on a GPU. Uh, again, three million dollars, like you know, maybe some people can afford it, but we definitely want to re keep reducing these numbers so that more people can do machine learning and more people can run stuff, and also do more runs, like just be able to experiment more with different models, different configurations, and use these models a lot more aggressively in production as opposed to just have it as a sort of like nice to have research that you know only three companies can afford. So we're also very fortunate that like, you know, thought leaders like, like Jeff Hinton uh, believe that the IPU is, is the future of what machine learning hardware should look like. So we, we have like a huge torch to bear, but we're, we're very proud to, to do so. So like I said earlier, like if it comes to existing algorithms that run on CPUs or GPUs, odds are if you just run them on an IPU without doing any code changes, they will probably run faster. But they will all like, but, but my hope with this talk is to inspire you to think of like, what are some unique algorithms that you feel are just not a natural fit for a CPU or a GPU that would run well on a CPU? So like, how can we just like move forward to this MIMD world? So like I said earlier, like you can run your, like, like you can just use your existing models like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Onyx. Uh, you, and we, we have like our popular tool Tool chain. So this is like all the compiler and you can also like program and, and, and popular yourself if you like low, low level stuff. And, and popular, there's all sorts of stuff going on, like from a sparsity libraries to write libraries to do really fast and efficient randomness uh, to like really efficient like uh, neural network kernels. And all of this, you know, of course comes with the tool chain. Like we need to debug this stuff ourselves and we realize like this is a developer product. It needs to be easy to use. So we have all sorts of visualization tools that you can use to, to figure out like how to actually get all the performance you can get out of an IPU. Um, and the, the cool thing about this is that you see like all these cool graphs that we have in these slides were actually generated by our debugging uh, tool chain. So it's actually beautiful and, and useful. So, if you want to just play around like with an IPU a bit more, uh, you, you can like just go check out any of our public the developer examples. Like you can check out our code lists or like videos on YouTube, just depending on what your preferences are. So uh, enough about the IPU. Let's just talk about benchmarks for a sec. So the first model I want to talk about is BERT. So BERT is in this class of language models called transformers, which have taken the natural language processing world by storm. It's, you know, slaughters all the benchmarks. It's like super well. Uh, and we were able to train these models like 25% faster at 20% of the power. So then versus a GPU. So it means it's cheaper uh, and it runs faster. So it's like doubly cheaper. Um, and the nice thing is that, uh, so this is also true for inference, uh, not just for training. So you can, uh, you know, have much higher throughput. So, and this is really useful in settings where you're using these algorithms in real time, like where you're, you know, you're just running a query and you want to just check the results in real time, like look at the results of some protein that was generated or some like, DNA sequence that was generated. You could do like all of the above, like much, much more quickly, like, to, like to twice as fast. So the nice thing about this stuff from our end is like, I, I personally, am, I'm not a like a, you know, drug discovery or genomics expert, but I, but I do know my stuff in, in language. But all of the infrastructure stuff that we've built for language models is now just the question of swapping out like a data set and you can unlock all sorts of new, new use cases in genomics and drug discovery. So you wanna do protein generation, you wanna do attention models for site prediction, you wanna do drug target interaction, you wanna do drug discovery. There's countless papers on these topics today about using transformer models for all of these different use cases, getting state of the art. And we want to make it really easy for you to use them. And part of the advantage is that our libraries versus GPUs are a lot faster when it comes to, to, to sparse models. And so any benefits that like we would get in language, you should expect to also see in, in your workloads here. So like, just to, to, to drive home this point about uh, sparsity. Uh, so this is a collaboration we had with Microsoft. And here we were working on uh, efficient net, which like I said earlier is a sparse image classifier. And we use this to diagnose COVID x-rays. And so the idea is we were able to train the models a lot faster at much higher throughputs, which is, you know, really important for like, like a disease that ends like, you know, where time is of the essence or there's a lot of uncertainty around the impact. And so we, use it, we, we want this to actually be like a tool, like a, something that doctors can actually use to, to make decisions. 
And so here, like you'll see in the middle here, uh, so this is like we get 5x improvement just running efficient net on an IPU. And this is like the code as is. So we basically just like copy paste the code and it runs five times faster. But if you want to like in shot every single uh, bit of performance you can get, you can come and write like a, you can modify it such that like you can write your own kernels. Uh, you can just like write it with the IPU in mind specifically. And with that, we were able to get like 7x uh, throughput improvements. So another thing I'm personally very excited about uh, with IPUs is that there's this sort of meme where uh, Bayesian models are slow. And, and I believe this meme exists not because they're actually slow, but because they're slow to run on a GPU. So what would it look like if we could actually run probabilistic models with built-in uncertainty really fast? Um, and so here we were able to collaborate uh, with Carmel Capital. Like, so, so they had their own custom implementation of a Markov chain Monte Carlo model. And again, like if, if you've worked with Mar like, like MCMC, you'll know that it's pretty much used everywhere. Uh, and we were able to get like 26 times faster performance at 50% of the power. So just like drastic improvements on a whole class of algorithms that people thought have been uh, very slow. Uh, we also have like a more, uh, think of it like, like out of the box implementation where we just took a straight port of a model in, written in TensorFlow probability and we were able to get 15 times speed up. So like I said, like even if you're, if you just wanna copy paste your code, odds are it'll run faster on IPU. And if you're willing to go through the extra effort once things are in production and costs become very important and the performance becomes very important, then you can. So we, we wanna take you on this like sort of path. So like here, this implementation was, was by Citadel and they've basically been really happy with the results because it just makes their, their, their life a lot less painful. Like let's say you're running a model in an hour as opposed to a day, that means you can just like kick off a job, like you know, check a few emails, then look at the results as opposed to having to kick them off and then wait until the next day and then only then realize that there was a bug in your code or that you misspecified the data or that you wanted to change a parameter. So another collaboration I'm very excited about is uh, this other class of uh, probabilistic algorithms with learning uh, Markov random fields to, to learn protein folds and families. And so this is a collaboration with Arzita, specifically uh, Andrew Ban. And so the idea is that we can use, uh, we can learn Markov random fields to describe protein families and their folds. And we can also approximate uh, these MRFs as a supervised learning problem. And so the nice thing about this is that, again, because when it comes to just traditional multi-layer perceptrons, like we see such dramatic improvements in throughput and training time, uh, all of the results like translate here. And so here, like we're very excited about this collaboration with Arzira. And so there'll probably be uh, more public work that we'll be sharing soon. Uh, another area of research that I find personally interesting, so, so this is where I spend like my research time, uh, is graph neural networks. So like you, when you think of it, like even though we, a lot of times that like, we think of uh, you know, stuff like sequences, like the natural structure of a lot of stuff, like molecules, for example, is, is actually a graph. And there's no natural way to translate to use a graph in machine learning because you first need to pre-process all of these graphs into one giant, very sparse matrix. And then once you have this giant sparse matrix, you can do a regression or a classification or some sort of generative, generative task on it. But it's not going to run very quickly because these, because, these, uh, because these matrices are so sparse. However, in our case, because sparsity is our net advantage, uh, we, we don't have this problem. And so again, like this is like, like there's a paper incoming soon about this topic. And sort of to help you gain intuition around like, well, when maybe you're thinking of your own algorithms and you're thinking like, well, is this actually gonna run fast on an IPU or not? The intuition I, I, I would like to give you is this. Like, so let's say in, in LSTMs, like we see insane throughput improvement, like just like 300X, and LSTMs fell out of popularity in, in the NLP community because it's a lot more scalable to run transformer models because they, they might essentially correspond to matrix multiplies, whereas in LSTMs are sort of these sequential problems. And so anytime you have an algorithm that involves sequential processing and sparsity, odds are you will see insane improvements on an IPU. And you know, I, will, I will personally make sure of that if, uh, if we collaborate on it. So thank you so much, everyone. I was super glad. I'm you know, happy to take any questions. If you want to email me privately uh, to talk about how to provision IP, if you just have any high level questions, feel free to do so. And if you want to talk more casually over LinkedIn or uh, Twitter, just let me know. Thanks again. I was super glad to be here.